Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're going to be talking about the word of the year. But first, uh, since we did our last podcast, we've gone live and it's very exciting. It's more exciting for us, maybe, because we've been like giving it for a long time and now we get to see it all. We're not talking to an imaginary audience. We're talking to real people and real people who've been listening. It's amazing. Thank you all so much. And there are so many more of you than we expected. And your comments have been so much more than we've been expecting as well. There have been more of them and they have been nicer than we expected. I don't know. We weren't expecting mean comments. We weren't expecting this many nice comments either. So thank you for that. So I feel like we're doing a real podcast now because I get to say to people, uh, if you like this, then go to iTunes and leave a positive review. And that just makes me feel like I really am doing a podcast now that I have to beg for likes. We've, we've leveled up. And uh, you should also know that we're in the transcriptions of the episodes. So if you are not a person who likes listening to things, I don't know how you got so far. Um, but if you know people who don't like listening to things, um, you can send them to our transcriptions, which are also on our website at lingthusiasm.com. And we also have a Twitter and a Facebook. We're pretty, we're pretty chatty, really, unsurprisingly. We're pretty chatty and we're also on other platforms like Google Play um, and YouTube if you're really not a podcast person and SoundCloud. So if you don't do iTunes, don't worry, we're there too. So Gretchen, you were at the Linguistic Society of America annual conference and as part of that, the American Dialect Society runs their annual Word of the Year vote. And they have it at the start of January, so it definitely encompasses all of the possible 2016 word time. Um, and it's a, it's a big vote, and you have been to the last few, and you were there for this one this year, right? That is correct. So we were in a big ballroom in the Marriott in Austin, Texas, where the whole uh, conference was being held. So you can picture, I'm trying to describe this for you. You can picture a big conference ballroom, uh, a couple hundred people in it. I didn't do a count. There were a lot of them. Um, they we finally got a big- There was standing room only though, from the pictures on it Twitter. It was standing room only, big packed conference room. I don't know, at least at least 200, probably more like four or 500 people um, in, this, in this ballroom and what we do is on Thursday night, we nominate for a bunch of different categories for Words of the Year. And then on the Friday night, we vote for those categories. There are short 30 second speeches from the floor in support or against particular words in those categories or to nominate a new thing. And then at the same big, we take nominations and vote for uh, the actual final overall Word of the Year. Sometimes it percolates up from the other categories. Sometimes it's a new candidate, depends on the year. So it's all a, a kind of a combination of like, structure and tradition and kind of freeform chaotic fun it's a lot of fun it's got a certain amount of structure to it we generally we always have a limited amount of time because that's just how conferences work and so the past all the years that i've been at it it's been chaired by ben zimmer who stands in front of the mic and tries to keep us moving along and and creates the votes and then he has a bunch of uh, vote tallyers so voting is by show of hands and there's a vote tallyer for each kind of section of people who goes walks down the the rows and counts the people in their section so they report back to Ben. You can just watch all this happen. They report back to Ben and then they put up put up the numbers and then you have Grant Barrett on the slides and so he uh, writes down those numbers and you can see him projected up there. He's generally in like a Word document projected up onto the screen and so he takes down those notes and also makes whatever snarky comments come into his head uh, when he feels like it on the slides which is fairly often so that's a lot of fun. So there's like a meta commentary happening on the slides and then there's a whole other kind of dialogue happening on Twitter. For, so for those of us who don't make it to LSA every year, hanging out on the WOTY16 hashtag, which we'll put a link to in the show notes, because there was lots of great tweeting happening around it. And it meant that even for those of us who weren't there, we got to feel like we were kind of participating. Yeah. So there's also the hashtag, which is always confusing for people because it's WOTY16 because the 16 refers to 2016, the previous year, whereas the LSA's hashtag is LSA 2016, because that's LSA happening in the current year. LSA 2017? 17. See, even I got this wrong. Um, <laughs> because it, it's whatever, what year are we in? Um, so those, the, the parallel conversations happening in the hashtags, there's also conversations in the WOTI 16 hashtag 
up to, you know, a month or two before because bloggers will start proposing their candidates for words of the year, making their blog posts with recommendations. Uh, people in general will just be posting in the hashtag saying this is what I think would be a good thing. People who can't make it but who normally come will be nominating stuff and sometimes people get picked up by, by people to say there's been some buzz around this and I'm going to nominate it. So there's kind of this advanced and parallel conversation that happens on the hashtag as well. I put my nominations on the hashtag a couple of weeks before the event, which was really fun because then I felt vaguely invested in the discussion. Yeah, last year I wrote a, an opinion piece about why Singular They should win and it did win, so I felt very proud, although I'm sure I can't take complete credit for it because <laughs> it was also kind of... But you did campaign for last year's winner. Yeah, it was kind of zeitgeisty of the year. There had been a lot of talk about it and so I was, I was happy to campaign for it. This year I was uh, campaigning to keep the emoji of the year category in. Maybe we should kind of talk about the categories in general because the American Dialect Society Word of the Year discussion is, is pretty elaborate because they have categories for different types of words and those categories kind of shift and change every year. Some of them have been around for a long time, some of them kind of come and go. And last year you got an emoji category up. Yeah, so the Word of the Year categories are kind of way of focusing conversation around particular types of things that come up a fair bit and a way of recognizing that there are often a whole bunch of words that are uh, interesting in a given year and kind of having a, a more focused discussion about that rather than just having a giant list of 20 and having to pick a single word in that. So some of the categories include uh, euphemism of the year, most useful, most likely to succeed, most creative. These categories have been for, around for quite a while and there's often different types of domains in those categories. But I was actually part of a subcommittee to change some of those categories because we have had in the past categories like most unnecessary and least li likely to succeed and most outrageous. And those are kind of weird because, you know, for words unlikely to succeed, why are we even voting for it? Is it even a word of the year? So sometimes the words would be weird in that category or something in most outrageous or most unnecessary. We would get into the, this discussion about whether the word was itself was unnecessary or the concept uh, itself was outrageous, you know, which was which. So those those had turned out kind of weird. So we abolished the least categories, least likely to succeed and most unnecessary for this year. And we added a couple new topic based ones like politics word of the year and digital word of the year and slang word of the year that kind of bring stuff back into domains rather than the idea of necessity. I think that was relatively effective. It was definitely a bit easier to vote on than trying to determine whether something was outrageous. Yeah, because one person's like, this is a word I've been using for years, it's completely fine, is another person's, oh my gosh, how can you even say that? It also depends because the room itself is made up of uh, anybody from the Linguistic Society of America conference that wants to attend. And so it's got kind of a mix. I mean, it's linguists, but it's got grad students, it's got senior professors, it's got undergrads, a few of them. So which wise it's a bit of a mix. And you sometimes you get someone saying, I've never heard any of these words, but you look at them and you think, well, I don't know, you know, how exposed you are to, to newer words. So it, it also depends on kind of where people are coming from. That's why it's a vote, I guess. Yeah. And it's, it's like quite a discussion. Yeah, it's quite a discussion. And, you know, in a room full of a couple hundred people, the speeches from the floor have to be quite short. You know, it's a 30 second, like this is one reason for it. It does turn into quite a lively discussion. So someone mentioned something about clicking this year? Yeah. So one of the things that was new about the vote this year was that sometimes when someone would make a really good point in a, a little speech from the floor, a bunch of people would snap their fingers. Cool. So you'd get kind of a wave of finger snapping across the room. But I thought that was kind of interesting. It's something that hadn't happened in previous years. I think a couple people just started doing it and then it would pop up when someone made a point. So that was kind of a good straw poll way of getting a sense of how much the room agreed with someone or disagreed with someone. Is that a thing from something that I don't know? I'm aware of it as a way to express agreement with someone. Like you can say snaps for this person or do a couple finger snap, snap, snap. So you can snap your fingers to indicate agreement. I've been aware of it for, oh, I don't know, probably like 10 years by now. So okay, it's a thing for some people. This kind of brings me to another kind of, you know, because I mean, that's, that's another thing I'm familiar with, but maybe it's a, a thing that happens in North America. But like, we currently have an Australian and a Canadian talking about the American Dialect Society word of the year. How, how has this happened? Like, because this is one of the biggest and it gets a lot of press in the kind of days after the vote and it's kind of taken as one of the like not definitive but we'll talk about in a bit like there's a whole bunch of different dictionaries that give their word of the year but the american dialect society vote is one of the, the biggest events why, why is that do you think i think it's partly because well it is it is the oldest event so they've been doing word of the year since 19d it was founded by alan medcalf he's still around he still comes to all the votes but he's kind of passed the emceeing torch to Ben Zimmer. So it's the oldest of the Word of the Year events that I, I think anybody's aware of. And the conference is conveniently timed for early January. 
So, for example, the Canadian Linguistics Association Conference, which I have been to, meets in May. And okay. it's kind of weird to select a word of the year in May. Yeah. So, and it's also, you know, it's much smaller. So I think it's considered a large group of linguists, but it is, there are some weird elements to it. Another weird element, so I'm, I'm kind of a fan of the age range because I think having a few older people in the room helps keeps us from getting too trendy. Um, having younger people in the room helps keeps us... <laughs> with the trendy word. So I think the age range is a balance and the gender range of linguistics tends to be fairly good, but there are more white people in linguistics and in academia in general than there are in the population at large. So I don't think we're totally representative there. Right. And there was, from reading Twitter, there was a bit of discussion around, and there seems to be every year around, in some of the categories, you get a lot of words that come from African American varieties of English. By the time, like, white girl Australian in England, Lauren, hears them. They're like so filtered through many layers of popular culture. But there's this like tension, it seems, between like taking these words or borrowing them or there, there seems to be something a little bit awkward about the American Dialect Society's relationship with some of these words. Would you say that's something that's reflected in the, the event? Yeah, I think the American Dialect Society's relationship with these words is a is a reflection of our broader society relationship with these words. So African Americans get stigmatized for themselves speaking African American English and or themselves speaking in ways that differ from what we consider educated English or what we consider mainstream English and, you know, can get penalized on job market and stuff like that. And that suddenly some of these words get, get adopted as cool and become popular when they weren't as popular in the mouths of the original people that were saying them. And so I think justifiably that's that's unfair, you know? I think that the American Dialect Society word of the year vote can in some cases reflect that words from African American English get brought into mainstream society, get picked up in art in places like BuzzFeed, get picked up by white celebrities and white suburban teenagers and things like this. And I think this is a process that does happen. And so in the sense that you're chronicling things that do happen, it's not necessarily inappropriate for the American Dialect Society to be reflecting that, but also to be make sure, making sure to reflect that these words have a longer history and have a longer context and that we owe them to the people that originally came up with them and that you can't just talk about them as if they started in 2016 or in a particular year without that sh that context before that. Okay, that makes sense. I think that the long-term solution is when you look at how words get borrowed from one language to another, one language or one culture to another, they often reflect the existing power relationships that exist between those cultures. So words get borrowed between English and French, but this isn't as fraught between the English because the English and French have had a relatively egalitarian power relationship through history. But that's not true for all of the words that have been borrowed into English, whether that's from African Americans or whether that's from indigenous peoples or other people whose history has been erased as their words have been borrowed. Those histories can be more fraught. And I think the least we can do is acknowledge that and give them credit for their linguistic creativity when we're doing that. But the ultimately, you know, the way to make the power relationships be less weird around those words being borrowed is to make those power relationships be less weird in society in general. And I feel like that's why I really appreciate the Twitter feed that happens around the word of the year because I get a much more diverse kind of perspective on these words and how people feel about them. And I feel like that kind of helps influence my awareness about words and their history, especially from groups that I'm not in regular contact with. I will say as someone who's who's been at the voting for a number of years, there are a number of people who make these points in the speeches from the floor during the voting as well. And I think they often sway the audience towards or against particular words based on what's going on there or pointing out the history of these words. It's a bit tricky with the nomination process to trace the full history of these words as they're being nominated in the same hour that we're doing the voting. <laughs> so some of that history taking happens afterwards. Fair enough. But I think continuing to point this out, continuing to point out that just because a word hits prominence in the New York Times, say, doesn't mean it's actually new that particular year. It may have a 10-year-old or a 50-year-old history among a different group of people that we need to recognize. I mean, we talked about this with singular they in the pronouns episode, that it has a history that spans centuries. It's just that it, it felt like it was being talked about and the time was right for 2015. Yeah. So the criteria for especially the American Dialect Society word of the year is not necessarily new, but newly prominent because the year in which a word is new, it's often nobody really notices it at all. <laughs> and so it's when it feels prominent. In practice, the way that gets enforced is when a word that has been nominated before gets nominated again. Ben Zimmer will just say, oh yeah, we had that word back in this year because he somehow seems to know all of these. He's a word of the year oracle. Basically, if it hasn't been nominated before, then it's fair game. Okay. And somehow Ben Zimmer just knows all of the words that have ever been nominated. Useful man to have around. Yeah, it's very useful. 
We haven't even talked about the winner yet of the American Dialect Society Word of the Year. That's true. We haven't talked about the winner. So the overall winner, in case you somehow missed this, the overall winner was Dumpster Fire, which can also optionally be expressed in emoji with the wastebasket and the fire emoji. But we did vote for it in its conventional English orthography. And I think partly people felt like that was a very good word to sum up what 2016 had been, and also how people had been talking about 2016 in terms of all of the bad things that had happened that year. Yeah, so it was my nomination in my, like, three weeks before the vote tweet. So I feel oh, congratulations. very smug that I am of, of the zeitgeist. You are on trend. None of my specific category votes were correct. I'll put them in the show notes. But uh, my, my word of the year was the one that won. Awkwardly, though, my, like, super backward Android phone doesn't have the waste paper basket in my emoji library. So I can't even, like, emoji tweet the word of the year, which is a bit of a tech fail. If you copy paste it from somewhere. I could. It's getting very elaborate by that point. So it, it's kind of, it was a jewel. The, the word is the word of the year, but people are also using the emoji as well. People are also using the emoji as well. I think there was some discussion about whether the wastebasket is a very good dumpster, because obviously those are quite different shapes. I think initially, at least when I had started using the waste ba- wastebasket plus fire, I had been using it to stand for trash fire, obviously something that means the same thing. Which in my dialect is rubbish fire or bin fire. <laughs> I would really say garbage fire probably because trash to me reads as American. So trash fire or garbage fire I have been using the wastebasket for, which I think is a perfectly reasonable use of a wastebasket. Yeah. But then of course, because dumpster fire is a synonym for that, you know, then you get the, the dumpster fire. And there's been some good commentary on it. We'll link to Ben Zimmer's language log post and Nancy Friedman's post on her blog about dumpster fire as the winner. I will say that there's also something else that comes up in pretty much every word of the year vote is when a word reflects a political idea or a, you know, event or a particular concept is voting for that particular word a political endorsement or is that simply a reflection that a thing has happened even if you don't agree with the fact that that's happened um and that was something that came up especially this year okay so is this american dialect society like admitting that 2016 was really bad by voting for this word well dumpster fire is comparatively neutral but if we look at some of the other categories and we look at some of the discussion that happened during that vote so things like deplorables and nasty women were uh, nominated there was some discussion about alt-right although i don't know if it ended up actually being nominated Uh, and these were certainly words that were used a lot in 2016 but is the nomination of them going to be taken in as endorsement and in some cases it is that's the thing so Last year, when Singular They was the one that was nominated, I read several articles in the months thereafter saying, well, one of the reasons why you should use Singular They, it has a long history, it, you know, solves a a convenient gender neutrality problem, but also the American Dialect Society has endorsed it. And so it does have that signaling function. Right. And we can't just say, well, it's a positive word, so we voted for it as an endorsement and it's a negative word, so we voted for it as a, like, warning Yeah. And in the previous year, the hashtag Black Lives Matter was voted for. And so I think that was, again, saying, you know, this was a significant event that happened in that particular year. But it's also saying the American Dialect Society, the people who are voting for that particular word of the year, would also like to assert that Black Lives Matter. It's hard to separate the political and social functions of words from simply their descriptive nature, even though maybe we'd like to do that sometimes as linguists. So obviously, Dumpster Fire was the ADS word of the year winner but it seems like every dictionary has its own word of the year there's words of the year all over the place at the end of the year it's becoming an increasingly popular sport i mean it's just such a good pr opportunity is this just a pr opportunity like is this why people do this i mean i think you can't deny that you do get a bit of press out of that and people like reporting on it and there's a bit of a sense i think among various groups of people that you various dictionaries and other groups that you talk to that places try to choose different words of the year because if you pick the same word of the year as someone else then you're not as interesting from a reporting side or you're yeah you're not making your own statement so i think that there was a widespread expectation that oxford dictionaries was going to choose brexit because they're because they're the british one uh and then when they didn't maybe that freed up collins dictionary yeah. to choose brexit so oxford dictionary <laughs> Dictionaries <laughs> chose post-truth for anyone who's interested. We'll link to all of these. And they also pick different uh, methodologies for choosing their words of the year. So the American Dialect Society has this big vote. And at that point, we're aware of what everyone else has chosen. So there's often a bit of a tendency to not bother so much. And the American Dialect Society vote specifically focuses on new words, whereas several of the other dictionaries, because they have statistics on what people have been looking up a lot, they often focus on words that have had a particular spike that year or that have been looked up more often than normal or or sat. And so those different methodologies will also tend to lead them to different words. For dictionary.com, for example, 
example, because I happened to be talking with Jane Solomon about this, they had a spike uh, in xenophobia around Brexit and I think also around the US election. So they were a couple of different spikes there. Uh, for Merriam-Webster, their word was surreal. And in previous years, they've had words like science. So they tend to choose a word that have just been overall high in that given year without particular spikes. And that'll tend to bias you to more, towards more common words. Right. So that's why you get stuff like surreal and science. Yeah. So I think partly people try to choose different methodologies just to keep it interesting, you know, and then if it comes with some PR, I don't think anyone's objecting to that. The Australian National Dictionary Centre vote for their word of the year. And that's, a, they kind of do an internal office discussion thing. They have a short list and then they have a winner. And I'm very pleased that this year's, or the 2016 word of the year for the ANDC was democracy sausage. So you might need to explain what that is. So a democracy sausage. Earliest sources tend to be around 2012, but we had an election in 2016 and they were very popular in 2016. Because we have this great system called compulsory voting, when you vote, which you have to, afterwards, often like the local schools and local charities will set up a barbecue out the front and be cooking sausages which is known as a sausage sizzle and you can buy yourself a sausage in a piece of bread maybe with some tomato sauce and onions and this is this is a cornerstone of democracy like the thing i was most excited about after i was 18 and i got to vote for the first time was that I got to vote and then I got to go out and have a, a sausage from the sausage sizzle afterwards. And uh, this year, thanks to the wonders of technology, people got really into setting up like sausage sizzle finder apps so you could find a really good way to find a democracy sausage af after voting. I, I don't know why all voting booths don't have these in other countries. Like I would like some democracy sausages in Canada, please. Yeah, it makes it makes it's just part of it being like an event. That sounds really fun. And it's definitely a very Australian word because I we don't have them. I, I looked up to see, uh, as a resident Canadian, whether anybody had ever declared a Canadian word of the year. And I'm very disappointed to report that I did not find much. So there was some guy who was declaring words of the year for 2009 to 2012 and then just kind of stopped. But I think this is something that I might need to get. You're going to have to get onto that, Gretchen. Yeah, I might need to get my friends at the Canadian Linguistics Association, who I do have many friends at the Canadian Linguistics Association. I might need to get them on that because everybody else gets their PR up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Canada's turn. Yeah, it's Canada's turn. So I'll have to see if we can get a Canadian Word of the Year declared next year. Um, and there are also other stuff from other countries, though. Excellent. We're not going to list all the countries, but Austria had a particularly interesting Word of the Year from their election. And in my best German, this word is 51 or 52 letters long. I didn't count. Reports vary. This, the Austrian Word of the Year is Bundespräsidentenstickwahlwiederholungsverschiebung. And it means something like have a recount of the election to do the election twice and uh, this was a thing that apparently happened in Austria this year so people were talking about it a lot. There's also a Dutch sign language word of the year. The Dutch sign language word of the year is you put your hand flat on your head and then you lift your fingers up kind of 90 degrees and put them back down again which is the Dutch sign language sign for Donald Trump. You may be able to figure out where the iconicity for that one comes from. So Dutch sign language declared a sign of the year which was pretty cool. I asked a linguist who works on sign language if there was an American Sign Language Word of the Year, and she said, oh, no, there isn't, but that's an interesting idea. So maybe stay tuned. 2017. There, if there is another an ASL Sign of the Year or an Auslan Sign of the Year, we will be sure to report back. Something that people may be wondering by this point in the conversation, having talked about the Dutch sign, the Australian democracy sausage, the dumpster fire, which is also in emoji form. By the time you get to this point, you're thinking like, what even is a word? Right, because the word of the year is often a phrase. Well, the Austrian one is basically like a sentence in English. The Austrian one would be a sentence in English. Well, it would be kind of a compound noun in English. And, you know, the previous year, singular they, it wasn't they itself. It was the fact that they was being used as singular. That was the specific part of the word that we were looking at. And this, yeah, this does get us into the question of what even is a word. And by the time you're kind of done with this, you realise that linguists play pretty fast and loose with the definition of words. The unit of the word, unless you're a dictionary maker or a lexicographer or something really specific like that. You don't often think about words when you're doing linguistics, weirdly enough. You often think about, like, the, I think the average person thinks about a word as like something with spaces around it. Yeah. But that can get really complicated really quickly. So if you think about numbers, 22, when it's written in numerals, doesn't have spaces, but when it's written 
uh, in words. You can put a space in between it, you can put a dash in between it, lots of compounds, you can put a hyphen there or not put a hyphen there. And does that make it two words now? I mean, if you're writing an essay for a class and you have a word count, maybe, but intuitively 22 with and without the hyphen mean the same thing. There, there should be the same word. Or if you take something like website, you can write that open web space site or a website altogether, and those should be the same thing. You know, and, and linguists would say those are the same thing. Yeah, so something like dumpster fire or democracy sausage, they are nouns, but they're made up of other words. So we think of them as compound nouns in linguistics. You know, I've kind of come to the point where I'm just like, I try and tell people like the word of the year is like word as in like a single semantic sense that has kind of one label. And maybe that label is a compound noun, and sometimes that label is a single word, and sometimes that label is an emoji. But language doesn't always just go with the white spaces. Yeah, and the white spaces are themselves artificial because you learn to speak before you learn how to write. And so, you know, you're, when the words come out of your mouth in a speech stream, you're not pausing between every single word. You definitely don't have to pause between every single word the way you need to put white space in between words when you write them. So website, you say without a pause in between it, regardless of where, what you do with the spacing or something like that. I think the best quote that I have about, you know, what a word is. So I, this was back when I was teaching and I had a student that came up to me about halfway through the intro course and said, I'm really enjoying this course, but the problem is before I started taking linguistics, I thought I knew what a word is. And now that we've been getting into it more, I just really have no idea. And I said, congratulations, you've become a linguist. <laughs> because <laughs> I would say I, I've been to conferences about you know, word formation and conference I went to a couple of years ago, which was entirely about words and how they get put together. And someone kind of made a joke to this room of a hundred or so linguists saying, yeah, well, you know, nobody really knows what a word is. And everyone was like laughing and agreeing. You know, if you ask a group of linguists what a word is, I don't think there's a clear consensus because it's not clear when you should put spaces, when you shouldn't put spaces. It's not clear, you know, there are some things that definitely aren't words or some things that definitely are, but there's a lot of stuff on the on the margins. And that's even only in one language, let alone across the world's languages. So instead of words, linguists tend to talk about units of meaning and units of sound. And in theory, a word is and units that combine sound and meaning. So in linguistics, you have a morpheme, which is some unit of sound that also has a particular meaning. And it's very clear that something is or isn't a morpheme because it has some sort of sound associated with it, has some sort of meaning associated with it. It doesn't matter whether that morpheme is attached to another morpheme or all by itself as a word. That's a unified thing to talk about. Yeah. But I've also realized as we're talking about what's a word that I collaborated on a video with Tom Scott, YouTuber, about what even is a word and some of the different things that different languages do with different words. So we're going to put a link to that video in the show notes if you want to go check that out as well. And we will also, of course, be linking to a bunch of different discussions of Word of the Year. For Lingthusiasm, transcripts, and links to all the resources and media mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and do feel free to leave us a review there. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. I can be found on Twitter at Gretchen A. McSee, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our producer is Claire, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic!